I'm Ann Bocock and welcome to Between the Covers. Nelson DeMille is the number one New York Times best-selling author of 21 novels, and that includes The Cuban Affair, The Charm School, The Gold Coast, and The General's Daughter. Alex DeMille is an award-winning writer, director, and film editor, and he also happens to be the son of Nelson DeMille. Together, they're the authors of a brand new book, and to say that it is a thriller is putting it mildly. What it is is a psychological thrill ride, and it takes you through the jungles of Venezuela. Please welcome the authors of The Deserter, Nelson DeMille and Alex DeMille. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am so glad you're here to talk about this book. It's such a thrill ride. It starts out in the beginning, because I do I want to get into a little of it without giving it away. We have an army deserter. He leaves his post in Afghanistan. He is captured and tortured by the Taliban. And then he ends up fleeing and escaping, and he is in Venezuela. So right away, we know what he did. We don't know why he did it. So as storytellers, is the power in the why? It's not like who done it. Uh, it's why did they do it? And I think this makes, a, makes for a better story. We have this army deserter, as I said, he's Captain Kyle Mercer, um, Special Forces, Delta Force, highly decorated. And for some reason, not only to him, he leaves his post in the middle of enemy territory, as you say, and was captured. And that's the, the mystery is why did he do this? And we don't know until, uh, I think the last chapter, I don't think we reveal it before then. Uh, but of course, there's also a chase and escape. Um, when that it is, a chase When you get to the, the, the jungle, we won't give too much away, but he spotted two years after his captivity, after he ends his captivity by actually killing his captors, well, that's I think chapter two, and he shows up in uh, Venezuela, actually Caracas, Venezuela. He's spotted by an old army buddy in a uh, bar, in a hotel bar. The army buddy does the right thing, calls the army and says, you know, the most, the most infamous deserter, Captain Kyle Mercer is, I saw him in a bar in, Af in uh, Caracas. And then, okay, chapter two, our heroes, Scott Brody, Army Criminal Investigation Division, his partner, Maggie Taylor, also CID, uh, called into the general's office and tasked with going to Caracas, finding Captain Mercer, and bringing him back to justice. Alex, it brings to mind, to my mind, the Bo Bergdahl story. It's not this story, but he was, he left his post in Afghanistan. Right. I, what was it, four or five years he was captured by the Taliban. Yeah, he spent a long, long time. That was the, the Bo Bergdahl story was kind of the seed of this whole thing. Actually, my, my father came up with that idea uh, with a publisher before I even came on. It was the idea that the deserter being a CID uh, case inspired by Bo Bergdahl. And the thing I found interesting about Bergdahl was, you know, if you're, if you're fighting in France and you desert, then you're in France. But if you're, if you're in the middle of Afghanistan and you desert, where are you? There, there's no safety. So there's, it, it, it's not just about running away out of cowardice. There's always this assumption that there was something more to it. There was some sort of intention behind deserting, even with Bergdahl. Um, so we thought that was interesting. That was a good mystery up front to kind of set. And we have, of course, changed the character from, I think he was a private, into some kind of an elite soldier, which actually makes it even uh, more mysterious why he would exactly. do something like that. Yeah. And we have new characters. We have Scott Brody and Maggie Taylor. And if, can we start with Maggie for a moment? She is really interesting. She is not, lots of people write and have the, you know, quote, pretty sidekick. Right. Boy, she is, she is just yeah. way above that. And I have to tell you, there's times in this book, I didn't trust her judgment so well. <laughs> <laughs> Who came up with Maggie? He did. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't understand women, but okay. I don't, I'm not sure I do either. But I mean, we knew our hero, our male hero, was going to be something inside of the, the kind of iconoclastic archetype. And we, we, we both decided we wanted his female partner, and yeah, to not exactly not be just a tag along, a sidekick who was just going to learn from him and kind of bounce off of him, et cetera, and just be a foil. We wanted her to have her own mysteries, her own like inter internal life. So 
-hmm. having her be somebody who off the bat, without, again, without giving too much away, there's some questions about her, about her past that we learn pretty much right up front um, before they're about to set off on this mission. That kind of gives her a little bit of sense of, of danger uh, to herself. And for your fans who love John Corey, they're really going to like Scott Brody. Do you want to give us a little hint into who Scott is? Yeah, Scott Brody, you know, I didn't want to use the same voice as uh, the, the, the John Corey voice. And Scott Brody's different because he's military. John, Bro uh, John Corey's NYPD, you know, New York mouth, wise, wise guy cop. Uh, but uh, Scott Brody's military, but um, I didn't want to get him too far from New York, so I made him grow up upstate. He's not, <laughs> not a city kid. He's kind of upstate New York, so he's got a little bit of that wise guy to him. Um, but, you know, with police procedurals, you, your cop is a, kind of a wise guy, and he's funny, and he's smart. Um, but when you go to the military world, you have other things going on. Uh, Scott Brody, RCID guy, who is a cop, he's an investigator, but he's thinking about other things like justice, well, more than that, honor, courage. Why in the military would somebody do what uh, Captain Kyle Mercer did? It wasn't so much that he deserted, but it's that he, he, he betrayed his men, he betrayed his country. And this is more important to Scott Brody and Maggie Taylor than what Scott Brody, what Kyle Mercer might have done. Or, and they want to know why, but then they also want to know you know, well, what motivated him. Uh, they, they, they know early on there's something else going on there. And you know, when you write a book, there's always got to be another level of something going on. And uh, when they finally confront him, and I, I won't give away the last chapter, but they finally confront him, they, they see in him a little bit of them, because they both combat veterans, Maggie Taylor and um, Scott Brody and Kyle Mercer. So they have something in common they have a bond, and at the same time, two of them are cops and one of them is a criminal. But you don't have that, again, that civilian confrontation. This is a different kind of thing. This is a bonding of military people who try to understand why Mercer did what Mercer did. And I think it's a powerful scene at the end. It's very powerful. This, this is an action-packed book, and the action is taking place in Venezuela. Now, Obviously, you didn't write the book yesterday. Uh, <laughs> things are happening in, in Venezuela. But I, I checked the State Department guidelines just before the show, and it is a level four do not travel. Right. If you're an American, you're probably going to get kidnapped. Right, right. Was there ever a discussion between the two of you of, let's go? <laughs> well, it was always me who was going to have to go. That was. <laughs> I wondered. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we talked about that, and then... Uh, I was going to go, and it was already dangerous when we decided to set it there, obviously, or else that was part of the reason we wanted to set it there. It'd be a good story and kind of a dangerous uh, place to kind of conduct a manhunt. Um, but we both realized uh, through the course of things getting worse, uh, also through the course of my wife uh, becoming pregnant, <laughs> we both had a long, long talk and decided that I, you know, it wouldn't be a good, a great thing if I got kidnapped, which was, so I talked to a lot of Venezuelan expats, and what I realized was and they all told me not to go, right? They all had their own terrible stories about why they left in the first place. And what I realized was, even if I did go and I took all the precautions, I might be okay, but I also wouldn't really see the country. You know, there is, the, there is kind of these islands, kind of fortified islands of safety, whether it's a hotel or an apartment or whatever, armored car going from here to there. But there, it's, it's, it's a very hard place, just from what I understood, and talking to people to actually traverse and get a sense of, even if you're actually there on the ground. You have a character in the book, Luis who is a driver, he, mm -hmm. he is extremely helpful to the story, he's not a lead character, but I absolutely felt so deeply for this man. And from who you've talked to, there must be thousands and thousands of Luises that are in this situation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, there, I think there's, it, it, the people I talked to, of course, were in a position to have the means to, to get out, you know, and a lot of people don't. But I think yeah, there's a lot of people that are caught in the middle, whether they're, whether they're poor and they live in the slums or whether they're middle class, they used to have kind of service jobs that are now gone. Uh, it's, it's kind of, they're, they're, they're rich or either leaving or again, putting themselves behind these massive walls and then the middle class is kind of getting poorer. So it's, yeah, it's a difficult situation. So you were gonna send him. And then <laughs> well, <laughs> well, then I realized I, I would have had to pay a ransom and I didn't want to pay a ransom. So. Yeah, I thought about that too. How much would it, I was wondering how, how expensive would it be we if I did get kidnapped? The, the book is doing right. really well. <laughs> <laughs> I, there is, you have us face some things in this book and probably in any book that has to do with war. 
about Afghanistan and things that people who have not been there, uh, it, it's front and center. And we are talking about the Taliban videos and perhaps war crimes that are being covered up and a lot of really unsettling things. And I think it was very clever how all of this came together to talk about desertion and whether being a deserter was ever justified. Yeah, you know, I, um, I was in Vietnam for a year and uh, when I was there, um, they had what they call Operation Phoenix, if anybody remembers it. Operation Phoenix was a CIA operation and um, the object of the operation was to identify uh, Viet Cong um, and kill them, uh, just without trial, just kill them. Unfortunately, they killed people that may or may not have been CIA, and a friend of mine who I graduated off the candidate school with was involved with Operation Phoenix and was actually arrested, and uh, a book came out about it called Murder in Wartime, if anybody's interested. Um, he was let go because the government understood that this operation was so bad that they didn't even want to bring anybody to trial because they didn't want it exposed. So I took this that I learned in Vietnam and I brought it to Afghanistan. And um, I won't give away the name of the operation because that's part of the, the mystery of the, uh, the book. But uh, we, we posit that the CIA is doing the same thing in Afghanistan that they did in Vietnam many years before, which is to eliminate people who may or may not be Taliban sympathizers. So, you know, in some ways, and all war is the same, some ways they're different. Um, I think my experience is back in Vietnam in the 60s, uh, at least informed part of the book. I have not been to Afghanistan, and I know it's a different war, but what it had in common with Vietnam is that it seems like a war without end. When these wars go on and on and on, you know, the people who are in charge of it get more and more desperate for success. They start to do things that are just kind of borderline Ill illegal, borderline against the rules of war, Geneva Convention. So, you know, again, by experience in Vietnam, I just kind of transferred to Afghanistan. It is not the story of the deserter, but to me there is an underlying current of what happens after you get home. We have, we have Scott and we, we have Maggie, and both of them are veterans. Right. And it, it's, it's still that um, aftermath. Yeah, and um, this book, uh, Scott Brody was an Iraq uh, veteran. He was infantry, he got wounded. Uh, Maggie Taylor was in Afghanistan, and she was with Civil Affairs, which is a very dangerous job. Even though it's not combat, you're out and you know, trying to, uh, you know, win, win the hearts and minds of the people. And so many of the Civil Affairs people have been ambushed. And, you know, our backstory on Maggie is that she'd been ambushed, wounded, shot her way out of this ambush. So you have these two combat veterans. And for reasons, you know, that are kind of hard to, you know, hard to put down in a book, they made the decision that they wanted to get into the CID, which is kind of, kind of interesting. They were looking more for justice and truth than where, where they'd come from in, in the Army. So they, they switched careers midstream, and they wind up meeting, and they're kind of fairly new partners. But they both have that experience. And they're both, I don't say they have post-traumatic stress syndrome, but they have been... Uh, they've been formed and molded by the war. By what Again, they saw. By what they saw, and also the duration of this war that is still going on, even as they have switched careers to Army criminal investigation, this war is still going on. So we get a little bit out of the book, in the book too, and what, what, what an ongoing war of that kind of duration starts to do to the personnel within the military. I want to know, because this is fascinating to me, how this happened. How did this collaboration happen? <laughs> I mean, did you, what, one day you woke up and went, let's just write a book together. Well, you want to... Uh, yeah, uh, will you come in? <laughs> I, you, I, I come in later, so you can, yeah, you can talk you. about the genesis. And then. Um, my, uh, my publisher many years ago, maybe not many, two or three years ago, asked me to, <laughs> to uh, do a three-book series and have a collaborator to help because they thought it would speed it up, it actually takes longer, but they didn't know that, so. <laughs> um, so I said, okay, you know, I wasn't crazy about the idea, because I had never, I had only collaborated once, 40 years ago on a book called May Day, 
Um, so by choice, you didn't do it again? I, right. I, I collaborated okay. with a childhood friend who was one of my best buddies. And after we finished the book, we didn't speak for about two years. Um, <laughs> you took a chance. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy collaborating. And, you know, uh, novelists, I was a nonfiction authors often collaborate. They have different skills that they bring. But novelists usually, you know, they want to work alone. Uh, I, I find I was very comfortable working alone, but I said, well, let me try this. So we, um, I had the outline of the deserto, part of, part of the outline, and we asked uh, my, my editors and my publishers we, uh, and my agents found seven or eight or nine writers, and we asked them to submit two or three chapters, sort of a contest, if you will. Uh, and they, they submitted blind. We didn't know who they were. We didn't know if they're male, female. And we all, seven of us all said, uh, this guy, and I won't mention the name, is the guy who wins. And it wasn't him, because he wasn't part of the running. It was just somebody else. And after about six months of working with a collaborator, I realized that this is not working, and I know it's not going to work. I put the project aside, but the publisher was so intrigued by the premise of the deserter, they really wanted me to, to, to pursue it. And so I was kind of thinking, who do I know who knows how to write? And one day it occurred to me that my son is a writer, and uh, it just popped into my head, and I gave Alex a call one night, and I said, how would you like to make some easy money? <laughs> is, you never, never want to trust Little somebody who says that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> was there ever a moment that you had hesitation about this? Oh, definitely, this? definitely. Um, I, two, for two reasons. The one being I was doing other things, and I had to decide if I wanted to put that, those things on a hold and kind of do a, something of a career shift, uh, still in the world of cr a creative world. But um, the other one being, I think, obvious trepidation over taking on a project that's difficult with somebody of his caliber and following and success um, and making sure that if I was going to do it, I would be not, not that I'd be an equal partner, that I would be facilitating something and I would be adding to it. Um, and we both feel a degree of ownership over, over the book, you know. Um, you, well, you should, you know, writing is probably the most solitary profession that you can have and turning it into a team sport seems like you're really asking for trouble. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, and I'd ask some other authors about that, and some of them, you know, really advise against it. Collaborations on novels were rare, but recently, the last 10 years, we're seeing more collaborations. We're seeing uh, father-son teams like the Hillermans and uh, uh, Clive Custler and his son. We're seeing uh, my friend Lisa Scottolini and her daughter Francesca. So, you know, you're getting the father-son, you're getting the, and the, and the mother-daughter, and in fact, you've got a couple that's mother or son, so it's, it's, been, it's been turned into some kind of a family enterprise with a lot of people. Also other collaborations and people are not related, but they seem to be working. So it was something that was like new in the industry, but, uh, but uh, really not something that had been done uh, you know, with any particular success. There hasn't been any wild bestsellers that have been collaborations in the past, um, except Sometimes when you get a best-selling author and you, you, know, you do collaborate. And James Patterson has kind of broke a lot of ground on this. He's got collaborators for almost every book. And he showed that it could be done. And you, know, you just have to make sure you have the right collaborator and, uh, uh, and kind of make it a plus rather than something that seems like, like it's diluted. It's not diluted. You're actually getting two heads uh, are sometimes better than one. But you just have to learn how to work together. <laughs> I, I, you still write in longhand, don't I you? I do, yeah, yeah. Now, that's hard. I mean, I, 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 how, were you, how were you doing this? I actually, I like the process, because so I, I was writing the first draft of almost everything on a laptop, <laughs> and I was um, emailing it to, to you. He was printing them out, taking his number one pencil, mm -hmm. oh, marking it up, okay. uh, scanning the page, emailing it back to me. And for me, it was nice, because instead of having you know this Word document with track changes and all these kind of uh, confusing way to keep track of it, I, I'd see you know, how much... Uh, how much pencils on this page? Let me see. <laughs> how, how did I do? And then, you know, it's almost to get this kind of visual sense of he wants to rearrange a paragraph and there's arrows going all over the place. And it was kind of, uh, and then I actually had to do the editing based on his uh, pencil marking. So I was actually still doing the changes. So I was kind of seeing step by step what he wanted, wanted to do to do revision. So it was an interesting process. I see some pluses because in, in what you do in screenwriting, it's heavy on dialogue. But the backstory is pretty concise, so right. you you do have strengths that that you can work together. Yeah, yeah. And I, I thought about that up front. Um, 
that uh, you know a lot of novelists tend to ramble. Uh, with a novel, you have all the space you need. The canvas can be as big as you want it to be. There are 800-page novels out there. I don't write them that long, but um, you do have the you know the luxury of indulging yourself. Um, but sometimes you have to know how to tighten it up, and uh, that's one of the first things I said to Alex. And your screenwriting. Uh, not just the, the, the shorter dialogue, but the structure. Screen plays have to be very structured and act one, act two, act three, and you don't wander too much off the page. So, you know, but you can take it from there. And I think you learn something, I learned something. Yeah, so. I think we actually both, because uh, on the other side of the coin, I, there was moments, especially in the beginning of the book, where I was, my screenwriter head was uh, kind of th thinking about, okay, uh, you need to get into a scene as late as possible, get out as fast as possible. Um, and then it was there, sometimes it was kind of, the scenes were missing their connective tissue that you sort of need for a book. And there was a, some scenes where he says, yeah, I think you actually underwrote this scene. There's more potential. We want to see right. what these looks like when these two people enter the room before they start talking to each other. Or how is this going to end? With, you know, it's not an ellipse. It's going to be, we're going to see how they conclude their, uh, their dialogue. And so it was interesting. I think we, if I shortened him, he lengthened me. So we kind of, <laughs> I think we kind of we were complimenting each other. Well, for all, your, your fans are going to know that this is your book because of the gallows humor. And, and I, that, that's what we live for. Scott Brody has quite a sassy mouth, you know, and, and things he said are just terrific. Well, he's from upstate New York. Okay. <laughs> he's not, not quite New York City, north of Westchester County. Um, you know, when you write a series, and this is the first book in a three book series, um, you want to get the character, you have to get, get the characters right. But when you've written other series, you want to make sure that they all sound the same. And this was a challenge for me uh, to, you know, Remember what John Corey sounded like and my other wise guy characters, but to make them sound different at the same time. It was a little bit different, a little bit easier this time because again, Brody was military, so he's using a lot more military stuff than any of my civilian characters would use. But yeah, he's still a wise guy, um, and of course, his female partner uh, Maggie Taylor is. She does a lot of eye rolling, and <laughs> she's not quite happy with some of his antics, and I think that kind of kind of. Uh, propels the book. I mean, you know, when when you're reading very grim scenes and things that are, look like they're going to go south very quickly, you know, Scott Brody makes a joke and she rolls her eyes. So. Uh, you said it's a three book deal that, that yeah. you have w with the publisher. I'm going to assume that the next one is also set in some very dangerous place, or can we not say that? We, yes. can, say. we can say. It's actually going to be a little different. It's, it's set in Berlin. So it's going to be some very, very dangerous people, but in a more familiar setting. Okay. Um, so this time you can do your research. I'm going to be. I'm going to love to do my research and go there. And, <laughs> and we both spent a lot. We both been to Berlin at least um, maybe two or three times each. So we know the city pretty well. Obviously, the U.S. Army has a very long, interesting history there. Um, lots of U.S. Army bases in Germany still. So there's a lot of uh, potential to explore what would happen there now. I assume. Both characters are coming back. Can we say that? Yeah, both mm -hmm. characters. Okay. They, they have such good chemistry. Yeah, and they do. And um, there was some uh, romantic tension there. Yes, I noticed um, that. <laughs> uh, which was not, you know, realized at the end of the book. So uh, yeah. at some point. But uh, <laughs> well, the other thing is, you know, um, and then like, as with the James Bond books, the uh, the peripheral characters, the ones that are not dead, will come back, uh, which will be General Hackett. And uh, Colonel Dombrowski, uh, they're the ones who always oh, really? okay. assign the mission to, you know, if you remember the Bond things, M always assigned the mission to James Bond. So it's a good way to start. It's a nice, I don't say it's formulaic, but it's a nice formula where, you know, the, the, uh, the operative goes into the senior officer's office, gets his briefing, gets his uh, task, and off he goes. So, uh, yeah, Berlin is going to be more of a challenge in some ways because, it is not dangerous per se, but it's a very atmospheric city, and it's got a lot of uh, a lot of dark history that we're going to try to that bring. That you will capture the book. in, in yeah. this book, and I have to say it because of the chemistry of these two people, and the fact that you are a screenwriter, they should be on the big screen. Is That'd there? Right. Is there a? Uh... <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Okay. Uh, sometimes it takes a while, right? Yeah, and yeah. I know a good screenwriter if they want to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, Hollywood doesn't make these kinds of action adventure much anymore. Um, they do other things, but having said that, my last book, which I was here for, uh, The Cuban Affair, 
Uh, we just actually got a, a very good movie deal with a uh, major studio and a major producer, uh, a, a studio that makes that kind of movie, that good action adventure. Um, so we're taking this project, you know, to the same people. Um, you know, and, and I, but seriously, I would like to see him do a screenplay. I think uh, once Hollywood sees a screenplay, and they, they can imagine it, but when they're reading the book, they're trying to figure out how, how much is this thing going to cost? I mean, how much does the Venezuelan jungle cost to reproduce in <laughs> yeah. Florida? I don't know, whatever they would produce. But so many things go into the movie that even though all my books have been bestsellers, I really have only had one movie made, which is The General's Daughter. Uh, but I think if we presented them with a screenplay, uh, we might have a leg up to sell this to, to Hollywood. Nelson DeMille and Alex DeMille, the authors of The Deserter. This has been such fun. I want to thank you both for being here. We can't wait to read the next one with Scott and Maggie. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Ann Bocock. Please connect with us on our website and like us on Facebook to find out more about our authors and join me on the next Between the Covers. Thank you.